There are several methods to place stairs in your project. A method that can create several stair layouts and has flexibility in documentation is creating stairs by component. To begin to place a stair, on the architecture ribbon, in the circulation panel, expand the stair split button. There are two tools available, stair by component and stair by sketch. Stair by component is the default stair tool on the split button. Select stair by component. As soon as I do, Revit goes into stair assembly edit mode. The ribbon changes to the modify create stair contextual ribbon, and there is a components panel with numerous options to assemble stair components. Ensure that run is selected and pay attention to the various types in the draw gallery. We can choose a standard straight run, full step spiral, center end spiral, L-shaped winder, U-shaped winder, or create a custom run by sketching. I will leave the straight run selected for now. On the options bar, we can set the location line to exterior support left, run left, run center, run right, or exterior support right. Depending on the location of the stair, you may want to use one of the left or right options to snap to an edge. We will use run center to create a straight run. We can also specify an offset if we want the creation path to be a certain distance away from the location line. In the actual run width field, we can specify the width of the run. Lastly, the automatic landing option is selected by default. When two separate runs are created to reach the next level, Revit will create a landing between the two runs automatically with this option selected. In the Type Selector, you can choose the type of stair you want to create by selecting from the types already defined within the project. Note that stairs are a system family, therefore they cannot be created or deleted, but you can create as many types as you like. I'll undock the Properties palette and make it bigger so we can take a look. In the Properties palette, you can see that stairs are built starting at the current level, which in this case is level 1, and extend up to the next level, which in this case is level 2. You can also set a base offset and a top offset to adjust any differences in its base or top level. There is also a desired stair height parameter that is only available if the top level is set to none. You can also choose to create a multi-story stair. In the dimensions section, the desired number of risers value is calculated for you based on the distance between levels and the rules for creating the stair. You can increase this value if you wish, but you can't decrease it because doing so would violate the rules used to create the stair. Note that you can also specify the tread depth. The minimum and maximum tread depths are established in the rules governing the type properties of the stair, but you do have some flexibility. There is also a place to specify the tread riser start number for annotation purposes. Building codes governing stairs are nearly the same throughout the world, and Revit's stair calculator already knows the floor-to-floor -floor height, so its calculations really need to be modified. Note that we just viewed the instance properties for the stair. In the Properties filter, switch to Runs. There are additional parameters here that control the run and are important to the creation of the stair. Under Constraints, we can specify the location line, which is the same as on the Options bar. Relative Base Height controls the base height of the run relative to the base elevation of the stair, while Relative Top Height controls the top height relative to the base elevation. Run Height displays the calculated height of the run and is read-only since it is a calculated parameter. In the construction section, Extend Below Base specifies a distance to extend the run below the base level of the stair. To extend the run below the floor, you must enter a negative value. The Begin With Riser and End With Riser options control whether or not a riser will be created at the beginning or ending of a run, respectively. When selected, a riser will be created. When cleared, a riser will not be created, and it will change the number of risers in the run. The actual run width can be specified under the Dimensions section. This is the value of the tread width without the width of independent side supports. This parameter can also be controlled in the Options bar. The actual riser height and actual tread depth are displayed here as well. These values are read-only as they are calculated by Revit. I'll redock the Properties palette and then create a stair. To begin, I'll click anywhere to pick the starting point and then zoom in to make the stair easily visible. You can move the cursor in any direction. 
pay attention to the horizontal alignment indicator. The temporary dimension shows the distance from the start of the stair to the current position, while the outline shows the footprint of the stair to create a single run of stairs between the base and top level. There is also a stair counter, which changes as you move the cursor. The cursor automatically snaps to tread depth increments and riser lines appear. When you move the cursor past the end of the outline, the stair doesn't get any longer. Revit will simply create the necessary run of stairs to go between the levels you specified. I'll click to finish the initial stair. A line now appears pointing in the up direction, and I see the number of risers indicated at the top. The first riser is also labeled. If I create the stair in the wrong direction, I can flip it using the flip tool in the tools panel of the contextual ribbon. Also in the contextual ribbon in the tools panel, you can click railing. This opens the railing dialog. You can expand the dropdown to see the railing types that are already loaded in the project. If you wish, you can then choose the railing that will be attached to the stair. I'll select guardrail pipe. You could also select the position. Click OK to close the dialog. Then I'll click Finish Edit Mode. Once completed, you can see the up text and the up arrow, as well as a break line that corresponds to the cut plane location in this plan view. Above the cut plane, the railing, stairs, and stringers are shown using dash lines. I'll open the Level 2 plan view. Here I can see the down text and a down arrow, and the stair is not broken because no cut plane is involved. Note that stairs do not automatically cut openings and floors. So when you place stairs that go between floors, you may also need to create openings in the floor. I'll switch to the 3D view and in the view control bar, change the realistic visual style. This gives you an even better view of the stair. When you apply materials to your stair and rail objects, you will see shading according to those material definitions. I'll create another type of stair. Switch back to the level one view, and activate the Stair by Component tool from the Architectural Ribbon. In the Components panel of the Contextual Ribbon, select L Shape Winder. Now, when I move into the drawing area, the stair is on my cursor. The stair is already defined by all of the properties set in the Properties palette. There's an additional option in the Options bar to mirror the winder. To create the stair, simply click in the drawing area and then choose Finish Edit Mode. Next, I'll select the run by hovering the cursor over the winder and press tab until the run highlights. Once highlighted, simply click to select it. Looking in the properties palette, there is an additional section for winders. These properties will further define the winder type stairs.